Welcome everybody to Theory Underground. I am your host, David McCarricker, and today I am joined by a couple of guests, aka co-hosts. I don't really know what you guys are, but your friends, fellow travelers, and um, people that I've been thinking and talking uh, to and with uh, about uh, time energy, as well as uh, theorists who are essential to the Time Energy Theory Project. And so it's good to have you both, Mikey and Nance. How you guys doing? Doing good. Good to be here. Great. Fantastic. So, Mikey, I think you should kind of kick this thing off by saying what it is that we're doing and why we're doing it. Sure. Okay. So today is a little bit of two different streams put into one. On the one hand, it's we're hoping that it serves as a decent introduction to the work of Andre Gores, who is a thinker that is, in our estimation, greatly underappreciated. Yeah. And if you go to YouTube and try to find any videos about him, you'll be surprised by the scarcity of it. There are some videos in French, but basically nobody in English seems to talk about this guy, engage with this guy's work, and we all would say that's a major mistake. Um, so on the one hand, we're hoping just to give a basic introduction to his work, a basic orientation with it. Um, on the other, it's kind of a celebration stream. We just want to say, hey, this guy existed and he's really important and deserves to be read and uh, he deserves some some real attention. Um, Dave, you, when we were talking yesterday, you, you said something that I really loved, which were you said, Andre Gores is the Marxist. Andre Gores is the Marxist who gets it. And if we just can yeah. uh, succeed in unpacking what you said there and what that means, um, I think we will have done justice to his work and we will have succeeded in giving a good introduction to it. And so, yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll just say like, I just want to say, so I, I stumbled upon this guy because for a long time, I've look, you know, you know how much, how important the Marxist tradition is for me in my, my thought and my work. I'm all, I'm some kind of Marxist in spirit. I think I'm always going to be that. Um, but there's certainly some Marxists I agree with more than I do with others. And, um, I would just say Gores is really my kind of Marxist. Um, and, it was really through me searching around on Amazon. I was I was just like, man, is there any Marxists that I haven't read who are more tapped into what I'm interested in, what you're interested in? And just through certain word searches, I found this this book by Gore's called right here. This physical copy, Past to Paradise on the Liberation from Work. So mm -hmm. basically, I'm I'm like, I want the most anti-work Marxist philosopher I can find, and I found him. Uh, in this guy, I, 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 be, I mean, if somebody can out anti work him, I really want to know that person. <laughs> so, um, it's, it's our, it's our fundamental adversarial relation to work, especially wage labor, um, that, that motivated me to try to go find a Marxist like this. And I mean, spoiler alert, that's what you mean when you say he's the Marxist who gets it. He's the Marxist who understands Work is bad, which I mean, as simplistic as that sounds, but I, I'm fine. I accept the simplicity of that moral judgment, right? right. Um, work, especially wage labor is bad. Um, what would be great is if people didn't have to worry about money and if they had their time, of course, he's not going to add in the energy like you do, but um, he's a, he's a forerunner to time energy theory. Proto um, time energy. He's, he is one of the key yeah. proto time energy theorists. Yeah. And so, because you and I are, we both champion a politics of time energy. Um, he, he's really our, our one of our, I mean, for me, I guess it would be Marx and then Gores as far as, you know, of course, Marx says, don't call me a Marxist, but uh, nonetheless, uh, when it comes to the Marxist tradition, this guy is at the very top of my list and appreciation and respect. And so that's, that's it. And just, I just want to say, look, this, I do recommend if anybody wants to read Gores for yourself. Go get Paths of uh, Paths to Paradise. There are some other really great books here. Um, Critique of Economic Reason, uh, Capitalism, Socialism, Ecology. 
uh, Farewell to the Working Class, and we have one called Reclaiming Work. So mm -hmm. lots of good stuff to uh, read from Gores. And I have uh, a couple of things I'm going to say in short, and then I have a longer statement prepared. Um, but then I want I want Nance to go before that. But I'll just say really quickly that when I say that he gets it, I think that he gets that the game fundamentally changed in the 20th century to the point where he cannot be a traditional worldview Marxist, but at the same time, he still holds to uh, the core principles, um, that being that capitalism is better than the things that have preceded it. It's better than feudalism. Um, it's better that it, it, he doesn't want to return to something before capitalism, but also capitalism is a monster. And he gets that it's ruining people's lives. He gets that it dehumanizes and debases us. He gets at the most visceral level everything that has motivated me to get out of bed at 4.30 or 5 a.m. most mornings and just get to work on time energy theory or things related to it such as Theory Underground, um, such as the app, the whole site, the whole course matrix that I'm setting up, the whole vision of it is ultimately to get me to a point where I can actually do what I want to do with time energy theory because I'm not developed to the point that I want to be yet to be able to write the book that I ultimately feel like I need to be able to do in the same way that Mikey is also developing himself for the book that he's ultimately been working on for five years. Um, and if we think about the research that went into that beforehand, we could say 20 years. So time energy theory is a field. I think it's a space. It's something that gets opened up by running certain thinkers together and taking certain core insights and developing those. So from Heidegger, I get the fact that Time is not anything like we tend to think of it, um, and that existential time, the kind of time that matters because we are humans, and I don't give a fuck about non-human time, human time is something that capitalist time is running counter to. Um, so right, like Heidegger does a great deconstruction of modern clock calendar time, uh, but he does he never really thinks about energy because he presupposes a, uh, that just all societies have to expropriate and exploit the overwhelming mass majority of human beings uh, time and energy uh, so that he or a handful of philosopher kings are able to actually have it and then of course they can spend their time poeticizing or disclosing being right now I disagree with that aspect of his project fundamentally, but I think his deconstruction of uh, modern time is crucial. And then I run that with Marx, right? And from Marx, I get the critique of estranged labor in his early work. And in, even in his later work, there's still this thread of a life spent working is not a life worth living. The traditional worldview Marxist standpoint says, yes, because the workers' interests are not being represented in the state, and that's the alienation that we care about. And so as long as we seize the state and and, and, and the workers own the means of production, um, then don't worry about it, folks. It's going to be okay. They're not thinking about liberation from work, though. Marx was. He fundamentally always was. There was never a time when he wasn't thinking about liberation from work. He thought it goes without saying. But it didn't go without saying because that thread got lost for the most part, approximately for the most part throughout the Marxist tradition, that thread gets lost. And so uh, that's – I think Gores gets it at that level but also Gores understands that the 20th century happened and he doesn't just choose a side and then glorify it uh, doing apologetics. He actually is very critical of all sides in all of the world wars and um, he's aware of the PMC. And he's also a proto-CMT uh, theorist. So he's aware of the PMC and he's aware of CMT. So what does that mean? It means that the professional managerial class, and if you don't want to call it a class, you can call it the professional managers of capital. That's what I do. Um, or you could do what someone else on the phone with yesterday said, which uh, the, by, who goes by the name of Thomas. Thomas said, no, I just go professional managerial cast. Okay, But these are just different ways of talking about the people who have different interests than the rest of the working class and different interests from the capitalist class. But at the same time, the way that their interests align with the capitalists 
puts them against the workers, right? So they are all about class conciliation and representing the interests of the workers who need to keep on working. So their explicit or underlying message is almost always, um, we know best, listen to us, subscribe to the good ones, the deserving ones of us, and uh, get back to work. Right? As long as you're subscribing to the right thinkers, then you're good. Don't worry. Everything will work out in the long run. The long run pr progress will be one. But uh, no, you thinking for yourself, figuring these things out, and me helping you actually understand those things, that ain't part of it. Right? So that sort of Sounds separate- Sounds like a priest class. It is a priest class, right? But it's, it's the, the, the difference between the PMC and priest classes throughout history is that the priest classes serve the king and mediated religious interests with state interests. And the king was obviously the state interest. Capital is a third category between church and state. Capital is its own category. And so this priest class exists to keep capital and workers unaware or to keep workers unaware of capital, how it actually works, and to instead keep people thinking within culture war divides. And so most of their arguments happen over um, which ascriptive hierarchies do or do not um, uh, deserve a place in the meritocracy, which is to say, oh, well, race race should not have anything to do with whether a person is succeeding or not in our society. So I'm against that. So I'm anti-racist. Uh, but then on the slide, they are saying, yeah, but if you happen to be white and then you fail in our society, fucking sucks to suck, dude. You had all the privileges in the world given to you and you're still failing? What's wrong with you? That's the subtext, right? Um, and obviously on the other side of uh, whether or not an ascriptive hierarchy is legitimate within the meritocracy, uh, Dr. Adolph Reed Jr. is really good at pointing this out. He'll say, you know, like the, the other side of it would be, well, um, you're just not... You're just not working hard enough. You got to pull yourself up by your bootstraps, um, or oh well, you're you're uh, from some other country. It's going to be harder for you, or you know they, they rationalize some ascriptive hierarchies, and while they go against other ones, um, and that's that's ultimately what the PMC currently focuses on. But what it functionally does is it creates class conciliation between the working and ruling class, um, and and. Uh, division within the working class. And I'm not saying this in the standard leftist way. The standard leftist way that Barbara Ehrenreich would talk about this, the standard leftist way that Catherine Liu would talk about this, is to say, therefore, all we need to do is have the PMC actually um, center class solidarity within the working class, and then everything will work out. I am uh, a bit more of a post-leftist in in, in this one regard, and that is that I do not believe class consciousness or solidarity are sufficient conditions for anything. Um, uh, they might be important. I don't even know. I, str I think that the, whenever I hear people use those words, it just sounds like platitudes to me at this point. 200-year-old tired platitudes. That's what it sounds like to me. Um, but I do think that their critique is getting to the heart of what's wrong with a traditional worldview, Marxist, or, or Marxist worldview, and that Gore's got it. And in, in that sense, a lot of Marxists see him as part of the new left. But I think that's also not fair because I think that if you actually read him, he is a critic of the new left. So he's a critic of the old left and the new left. He's interested in what's the next left. And that's my fundamental question. Now, he never puts it in that way, old, new, next. That is my formulation. If you ever see anybody saying it out in the wild, you have to give credit where it's due. But as far as wondering, well, what's the next left? That's what I'm doing. And the thing is, is I don't believe that the next left is necessarily going to be coming from the left, meaning that any radical, emancipatory, broad-based organizing uh, effort is not necessarily going to come from what today calls itself the left. There might be people involved who are a part of it, who knows. But because I'm not uh, a reactionary, I'm looking to the future thinking new things are possible, and people who say nothing outside of left versus right is possible, I consider to be reactionary because they're trying to hold on to something that is in the past, and not only is it in the past, it's so much a part of the status quo, and that, that they're not able to think beyond it. Chris Catrone is a good example of this when he says that you cannot look, he says that anything that calls itself not left or right is just right, and that it always ends up going back to the right. And it's like, 
okay, man, I mean, cool, but also what about radical imagination? What about the fact that these are reified instantiations of, of, of bourgeois society that people take for granted and act like it comes down from heaven? It is intuitive, like left hand, right hand is intuitive. That's why we go with it. Left versus right is intuitive. That's the staying power of the metaphor. But I just personally, I, I will take up the position of the person throughout this conversation of, I just don't think that that signifier left carries much value outside of um, giving us some kind of like in-group circle jerk status. And uh, I think that Gores more or less gets it. Now, in the B-side that I did with Nance, where we read through all of Paths to Paradise, message us if you want to uh, to access that. I'll sh we'll, we'll both share it with you if you want to listen to it. Um I had actually said, I think of him as a post-left thinker, but then I never really, you know, argued my case. And I'll just say for now, I'll save it for later, but I do think of him that way, though I don't think he thought of himself that way. Nance, what did you find of value here? I really liked um, his tr treatment of work, the fact that um, for many Marxists, work and labor is glorified and it's like yeah we're just going to do all this working class stuff and while that's important and while it um it feels good to identify as a worker uh it's also just another instrument of our own um of the, of the status quo and the fact that he is thinking about how can we overcome this socially necessary labor social social reproduction um we'll never be able to completely escape it but we can uh, mitigate and minimize it uh, using contemporary tools. He wrote this in the 80s and he's really big on automation. He's really big on the, the digital revolution. Um, but he's, he's really being forward thinking and, uh, and I like that. He does a proper Marxist um, critique of, of current situations rather than just writing the same book over and over and over and over again for decades and decades and decades, which so, I mean, I, yeah, there, there are Marxists that I really like to read. Um, but Gores is doing something, um, more forward looking. Yeah. He's, he's really looking at things as they are. Um, he's not idealizing anything. He's not historicizing. He's not relying on tired old tropes and shit. Like he really is, uh, I want to figure this shit out. I I want to, um, I want to win the coming war, and I like that. That like he uses a lot of language, uh, or at least he's identifying a lot of concepts that I think still people um, don't accept when it comes to um, winning the war for a human future. Like he's he's dealing with automation and computerization and. Um, atomization and and like all these things that do matter and are important and we may be coming to a point where it's too late to do anything about them and people still don't read this book and it's like come on i don't think anybody read him at the time and i i have seen for instance Mikey, you were good for pointing this out. Nick Cernicek and Alex Williams in Inventing the Future, they do reference scores at the time that I originally read it and the second time that I read it. I, it just completely flew over my head. I was not aware. So there are people- It's primarily in footnotes though. It's primarily in footnotes, yeah. And so it seems like he generally doesn't get taken too seriously. Um, I do want to point out that the wonderful essay at the end of Paths of Paradise called The Politics of Time or something along those lines um, is not the first place to go. I think it might have been where you first went, Mikey, but I think that if you actually just yeah, read... It, it's like, oh, he's doing time energy theory. Right. It seems like he is, but it actually most of what he's doing is making failed predictions, which is like every Marxist's favorite thing to do, it seems like. They love to make failed predictions. He's like, by the end of the 20th century, he, automation will have displaced the majority of the workforce. And it's like, God damn it, dude. Why are you so assertive on this point? Like that, you had 20 years, 20 years ahead of you, and you're like, yep, all of these changes are just going to happen in that time. But okay, what's of value, I think the most value, is the 25 theses. 
in Paths to Paradise, which is to say it is as though he's doing to the left what Martin Luther did to Catholicism. He is walking up to the big old uh, church doors there and nailing his thesis to the door. And these 25 theses are about why anarchists who want to focus on localized forms of autonomy and and, and expression um, are wrong, and why Marxists who just want to focus on uh, seizing the means of production and having a you know a, a, a controlling the state like how they have it wrong but at the same time though I think that he does a really good job of not throwing the baby out with the bathwater with either and honoring and dignifying the anarchist and the Marxist in any leftist that is kind of in touch with those aspects of of, of freedom right um, and I, I do believe that both of those tendencies are in touch with something about freedom. And of course, people who just kind of throw out the left with anarchists and Marxists and just call it, oh, fuck it. They're all just stuck in, you know, platitudes and slogans from 200 years ago. They've completely lost touch with reality. People who do that out of reaction because they don't like the contemporary existing left, um, part of what they're forgetting about is just dialectics and that we have to kind of honor the core human insights that create these tendencies and there are different kinds of freedom and overdoing it in one area of freedom erases other kinds of freedom so for instance uh with the soviet state overdoing it on the war communism obviously there's a kind of freedom that can only come from structurally um setting up a society so that we can actually have things and not spend all of our time toiling to have those things right but at the same time and obviously doing so means that you keep away those forces that just want to turn you into a slave. Absolutely. Uh, and, and, and that's something anarchists don't tend to understand. But what, these, what those kinds of Marxists don't tend to understand is that localized forms of knowledge exist and can be more important than science you know, high modern, codifiable, you know, explicit, formalized science. Um, so localized forms of knowledge exist. Um, humanity and, and being a human and living the good life has a lot to do with having real immediate relationships with other people. Like actually knowing other people in your own town, um, being in touch with the, lo the locale, um, and, and that autonomy and freedom, really getting to exercise your creativity, your voice, localized decision making, cooperation, these are things that capital ha doesn't want us to have. And that they don't think too hard about what, when they're doing war communism up at that large structural level. And so these two sides don't tend to talk to each other, but I think that Gores talked to both sides and he did so in a humane way that uh, was able to do something dialectical and I think that it's a genuine innovation. And I just say that with his 25 theses nailed to the heart of capital, Gores became our Martin Luther. <laughs> yeah, man. The other thing I would say is just if being a socialist means glorifying work, glorifying wage labor, then we are not socialists and Gores is right there with us. Absolutely. Yeah, and that's kind of why I'm calling him po post left or like a proto post left kind of thinker. Even though he thinks, you know, that the the good things in life came from worker struggles, like the T-shirt that I'm wearing that says "Thank a Union," and then it says "For the Weekend," for child labor laws, for minimum wage, eight hour work days, the paid vacation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? That, that's what this shirt says. I have problems wearing this shirt though. Um, and, and I feel weird wearing it because I'm kind of split on this issue because I don't believe that unions are just a good thing no matter what. I think that whether it's good or not is wholly dependent on your relative situation, where you're located, what you're dealing with, what's going on. But when people try to unionize 
uh, the Young Turks or unionize current affairs. That's the left eating itself. That's fucking idiocy. Those are people who Gores is more sympathetic towards than I am because he's willing to court their feelings. I just think it's stupid. I think it needs to fuck off. Go unionize Walmart. Shut the fuck up. Leave small petty bourgeois like, you know, media organs alone because this is like me how uh, in the Underground Theory volume forthcoming coming out here in like a week and a half. Uh, he says maybe Theory Underground needs to be a little bit more decentralized. Um, what is this push to decentralize things that are just getting their legs under them? Why don't people go try to decentralize or seize control of Amazon and leave the little guy alone? Because actually I know what I'm juggling and it's a hundred fucking things at any given moment. And training other people or looping other people in is what kept me back and kept me down under and not really doing anything for over eight years. So everything I've accomplished in the last six months comes from the fact that I'm the sole person in the administration doing things, okay? Outside of Anne getting paid to be an accountant. Um, outside of that, uh, I'm doing everything and it's like, uh, that's important. Anyway, all my only point is, is that this is uh, this tendency exists and it's, it needs to be combated. Now, Gores develops a way of talking about free, autonomous labor opposed to, what is it? What's the other kind of labor? Is it called heteronymous? Yeah, heteronymous. There's heteronymous labor. There's local cooperative, small scale, uh, working with other people kinds of things. That would be like your community garden. And then there is autonomous labor. Mikey, what you do when you get off the clock and you go and you work on, that's autonomous labor, right? You're doing autonomous labor for theory. Um, but if I, but if we are cooperatively doing something together, then that would be the small scale cooperative thing that he has in mind. But then for everything else, like creating um, uh, washers and, and nuts and bolts and uh, computer chips, that's necessary labor that we need to be able to presuppose to be able to do the things that we want with our autonomous labor or our cooperative labor, right? But we can't just do that when we want to. You can't just show up at the factory at 5 p.m. and go, oh, I'm going to work for a couple hours and I deserve to have just as much UBI as everybody else, right? So Gores is trying to think really seriously about, okay, we want people to have the maximized amount of free autonomous go do what you want time I would call that creative power as opposed to labor power um, which time energy is the virtual precondition of labor power and it can be directed towards creative power okay but it can't be directed towards creative power if we don't have large energy infused repeatable blocks of time throughout our weeks uh, which is the definition of time energy and so uh, being able to switch from a society where all of our time energy is going towards labor power, towards creative power, and then other forms of organizing, cooperation, expression. Maybe you just want to play video games the whole time, dude. I don't give a fuck. Whatever it is, we want to be able to maximize your ability to go do that stuff. And so the standard anti-work position is just fuck work. I don't care. Automate everything. Space communism. We'll suck each other's dicks. It'll be great. I agree in theory, except that I want theory to be plausible. I want it to actually be something people can go, okay, that'll work. And a society without the widgets, without the computer chips, it's not going to be one we want to be in. And you can't have robots creating the robots to create the robots all the way down. You ultimately need humans at some point in that system. They're probably going to be high tra highly trained technicians and engineers and computer programmers, but there's also going to be jobs that just don't make sense to automate. And he, Gores, focuses on that and he hones in on that and he theorizes it. So it's basically like every time every person on the anti-work Reddit, which by the way, we're dedicating the stream to, we dedicate it to you all at anti-work Reddit. We get it. You get it. But every time you go out into your real normal life and you engage with people who don't get it, 
Gore spent his whole life thinking about how do we respond to those people? And insofar as those kind of, yeah, but have you thought about this young kid kind of responses that we get from dads, basically, um, sometimes they're onto something and he's incorporated that into his theory. And so I respect him tremendously for, for, uh, for keeping the normies in mind and actually going, hey, sometimes they've got a point. And so, yeah, heteronymous labor it's going to be necessary and you'll still have to do it. The point is to automate it as much as possible and then make it so you only have to do it three hours a day or for a few years and then you get to take a few years off. Or And we'll, we've got quotes that we'll read about how he's thinking about the 22,000 hours that you should have to work in your lifetime. Um, but if you don't do that for everybody – then you're still in a class society. Bloomberg's kids, the Clintons' kids, the Trump's kids still get to grow up in a world where they have every opportunity laid out for them and they never have to actually break a sweat except for exercising. They never actually have to do anything that contributes at all towards the necessary reproduction of society itself. And I don't want to share this earth with people who live that way, who think that way. And personally, this is the little bit of a Leninist in me, I say cart them off to the gulag. I don't give a fuck. But that's why you should never vote for me. That's why you should never vote for any of us. We're not to be trusted with power, as Zizek says. But anyway, okay. So, and really quick, before I turn it back over to you two, because I know you guys got lots to say, I just want to read what Ann said. She said, we were at the grocery store one day while Dave was wearing that shirt and the cashier asked about the shirt. This was last week. And then said, so she asked about the shirt because she couldn't read it properly because I... I had the fanny pack on, you know, and so just kind of cut the words off. And so she was like, what's that say? I was like, oh, thank a union, you know, for the weekend, the eight hour work day, uh, children not having to work. She goes, I thank God for that. I just thank God for the, I just thank God for the weekends. And I said, and, 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 I, and I, you know, and so Anne's just kind of like doing, the, moving the groceries along and I'm putting them onto the belt there at the store. And I'm like, well, a lot of people had to fight and die so that you could thank God for that. And then she didn't say shit. She just was like, and I was like, you know what? I, what? You know what else? Uh, just a little reminder that uh, the punishment for sin in the Garden of Eden was having to till the land. It was labor. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Bob says you you, you sinned. You had you enjoyed. You go fucking die in the slow death that is wait that is labor. Yeah, yeah, and you're you if and and that's kind of like the the core piece of the Protestant work ethic, right? But we ended up having a good conversation. It just but there was like an awkward silence for like forty five seconds after I said a lot of people had to fight and die so that she could thank God for those weekends. And the irony of it that was that this was at a Winco, the first Winco to ever exist, that's in the the heart of downtown Boise, and uh. Oh, wait. No, it wasn't downtown. This was just here in Coeur d'Alene. My bad. No. So this was just here in, uh, in Coeur d'Alene. And she, uh, she works at a, a, a store that brands itself as worker-owned. So it's not actually worker-owned. Workers own like 10% of the company. But it's an, it's enough that they get to call it worker owned, and uh, but they do. And uh, can you speak to the fact that it's still better than a non worker uh, that, that, that where one where workers own nothing? Yeah, it's it's good in the sense that like they give you some equity in the company when you start and then that gets like put into your so it's work around in that sense and so that gets put into your retirement so it's probably one of the only like grocery store chains where you have people who have like made careers there and worked there even if it's in the same department for like 20 plus years building up that retirement so it's good in that sense it's like my at my store like i felt respected and they took my time off request seriously but that can happen anywhere so it really is just the like, oh, they've got this extra bonus of you get health insurance and um, your retirement is coming through like equity in the company or something like that. Yeah. 
the, you're saying that as a former uh, Winco employee uh, who was waking up at three in the morning to get ready to go to be a baker. So, um, yeah, they. I, I, I remember when Anne was like, "Yeah, we just got like a, hundreds of dollars back for as a Christmas bonus," and I remember thinking, "Wow, I've worked over thirty jobs. I've never experienced that. Even at the college, I didn't experience that." Yeah, they gave us a five hundred dollar Christmas bonus. And I was like relatively new. I had started in September, but even I qualified for that. I guess the shitty part was taxes took like over a hundred dollars of it. So it was really like a three hundred something dollar benefit or uh three hundred dollar bonus. So they should have just said that. But mm. mm-hmm. so I have the quote up here on the screen that uh I was referring to. So they estimated uh, he's getting this from somebody else that he, he cites, but um, I think he agrees with it. So he, the amount of necessary work in a society to make all the things that we want so that we can have good lives um, is going to be some amount. There is some necessary amount of labor that has to be done. It shouldn't take up your entire life just so other people don't have to do any of it. That's the point. So if everybody had to do the necessary labor, then everybody would have an interest in automating as much of it as possible so that we all had more autonomous time to go do things. And then people go, oh, one of the things that he addresses and that everyone with half a brain who's ever thought about this for more than a few minutes will realize is like, yeah, um, Even if a worker today says, well, I wouldn't know what to do with all that extra time. Well, yeah, but you would live in a different world, wouldn't you? People would be inviting you to go to other countries. People would be inviting you to go scale a mountain, to go do a triathlon, to go do some fun overnight gaming exercise thing where you all do a cohort, whatever, play Halo. I don't know. It doesn't fucking matter. The point is, is uh, we'd have a lot more freed up time and energy that could be turned into creative power and that could also go towards cooperative enterprises like community gardens but also there would be a lot of passion projects a lot of people who are just passionate about teaching would be teaching and people who are not passionate about teaching who are just clocking hours they wouldn't be doing it anymore right or or if there's a kind of teaching that's just kind of shitty well then people would do it for their necessary hours and then they'd be done right um because we're still going to need human heart surgeons even if we don't because there is ai that or or there there is automated things that can ultimately do that that existed 10 years ago um there's still going to be like care industry work right like uh you can have a robot come and put a wet cloth on grandpa's forehead, but it's not the same as if it's actually you. And grandpa might break from the dementia long enough to actually say something that's going to live with you for the rest of your life and you're a custodian of his memory. If you were living in a real community, if you were living in a real society, if you had real intergenerational relationships, that would be real, right? So anyway, what is the the amount of the necessary labor and how would that work? Uh, Nance, you wanna read the quote? This amount is unlikely to exceed 20,000 hours in a lifetime by the end of this. It would be much less in an egalitarian society Sorry, opting out. for less. Uh oh. Where at? Uh, the end of the century, that cut out. Okay. It would be much less in an egalitarian society opting for a less competitive, more relaxed way of life. 20,000 hours per lifetime represents 10 years full time work or 20 years part time work, or a more likely choice. 40 years of intermittent work, part-time, alternating with periods for holidays or for unpaid autonomous activity, community work, etc. The point is you can talk about this process in a way that people can relate to. I mean, despite, you know, it's hard to get anywhere with your average wage laborer, especially if you're trying to give them leftist theory of any kind. But you can explain to them uh the workers movement got us saturdays off right we don't we have weekends because workers fought for us to have weekends and 
I mean, one of the things I don't, it, it's, it's almost like a universal thing with the guys I work with. They all know, Hey, if, if we could easily have a four day week here and get everything done and have three days off. And the point of this is like, no, nobody, it's not going to happen tomorrow where none of us have to work. I mean, that's ridiculous, but we're talking about a multi-decade plan to roll back the working week um, and investing in automation. And yeah, this is, this is a long process. It's not going to happen overnight, but the point is people can start to understand that. Okay. And we say, look, if we had a four day week and everybody the whole country functions, it's it, everything works the way it does now, except we have typically three days off instead of two. They all go, that's great. Sign me up. And I'd say, okay, now what if we, we get to that four day week, everything works. And we say, let's flip the week. Let's invert it. Let's go to four days off three days of work. We've already established it and stabilized it. Society works, et cetera. And you just keep rolling the days back until what we have to work two days a week, one day a week. Okay, whatever. Um, and, and that's a plan that people can relate to that. I don't care what their politics are. I've said this to conservatives and liberals and that all makes sense to them. They're, they're, why didn't somebody do something with that in politics? Yeah, no shit. <laughs> Yeah, well, no the shit. secret, the secret that nobody wants you to know that, that, that it goes against the interests of everybody in the PNC it, who doesn't want to fall into the working class and doesn't want to alienate themselves from the capitalist class. It goes against the interests of everybody who's seeking to valorize labor power by making capital uh, or by profiting off of exploited labor time. Um, it goes against the interests of every political and religious establishment that pre supposes a population of predictable, dumbed down shells of what could be humans who go about their daily life existences working, 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 right? It, Dave, it's almost like we don't have to work so much to maintain productivity of society as to keep us fucking stupid. It's almost like that's the point of a job. Well, and that... Yeah. that language scares a lot of people especially a lot of more established leftists because you're you're kind of dipping your toe in the conspiracy ocean there um but it's fucking true like and people maybe they don't recognize it maybe they can't see the entire see it it's in its entirety but people fucking feel it like we are aware and we being the disenfranchised masses um, we are aware that we're just grease under the fucking tank treads at this we're point. Trash. And, and, and no, and, and, and that's why it's so easy to keep us apathetic. That's why it's so easy to keep us at war with one another ideologically and socially and politically. Um, because we're aware that, that it's all fucking useless bullshit anyway, but we can't with that knowledge, we can't escape work we have to go back to work tomorrow right. and our boss is a fucking asshole and we have all these fucking problems that we never deal with but we're always already in this situation and we can't fucking deal with it and we're more invested in social differentiation superficial fucking bullshit than we are with broadly identifying with our fellow fucking humans mm -hmm. and doing something about it because we feel powerless because we're currently yeah. powerless yeah because we are exactly but, i mean that's part of what i mean that's part of the difference right with what where we're at, where I understand when you've had groups that have been oppressed or marginalized, they want to fight for society's recognition in the sense, hey, we're humans too. Don't fucking exclude us, whether it's black identity, gay identity, trans identity. There's a fight to say, hey, we're humans true. Treat us the same. Okay. We want to kill our identity. We don't want it glorified. We don't want to have it esteemed. No, we want to die to our identity. This wage, uh, wage labor no, I don't want to preserve that. Right. I want to preserve the other identities that have been oppressed. This is the one oppressed identity I want to destroy. Right. And this that, is the only, the, the only oppressed identity I am personally invested and put all of my time and energy towards the ultimate destruction of. 
uh-huh. right? I, I People are like, oh, you fucking transphobes. You don't care about the struggles of marginalized. No, no, no. I care about the struggles of whatever. I don't give a fuck. I, I, I care about everybody's issues. I hope that everybody get. I even hope for the Catholics that they get to keep worshiping their God and get to do their sacraments. I genuinely do. I've got no future in which I hope that they get burnt or their churches get leveled. I just don't care. I want everyone to be able to have their special little things. I want my, me having the cake and eating it too means that the people across my life who I value, who come from all kinds of different ideologies, of course they're mostly white because I live in Idaho, but they're also they're all people representing every uh, ethnic group in, in that spectrum and all of my world travels. I hope the best for them all. And that's why I want to abolish the category of worker. I want to turn work into the chores that we already do. We already do chores. You already, one of the things Gores is so good about is pointing this out. He says, when you free up the time for a woman who's working three jobs and has a bunch of kids, uh, guess what that time goes towards? Chores, errands. It goes towards things that she already has to do. And guess what? The stuff that she already has to do is also necessary labor. So now she's just not getting paid for as much of the necessary labor that she's doing. Right? So that's how, without time energy, as a thoroughly thought through concept, freed up time just gets sucked right back into all of the other bullshit that we already have to do too, just so that we can keep showing up to work, right? Because you still gotta go pay your taxes. You still gotta go get your mail. You still gotta go through that mail. You gotta keep up with the things that are going on. And you've gotta psychologically armor yourself to go back to work, which means that you're not really relaxing on the weekend, which means that you're really just recouping energy and and, and stealing yourself to deal with that prick at work again. Mm-hmm. Assuming that your your boss is an asshole, but even assuming that your your workplace is all great, you love to work with the people that you work with. You find meaning in the work that you do with those people, um, and you are, are actually all doing something that's important and that would hopefully exist in any ideal society. Is there nothing outside of that that matters, though? And this is why time energy theory is so important, I think, is for it's it's meant to be intuitive to working class people. It's meant to sound a little corny to PMC people who already take their time energy for granted anyway, the relative amount that they have more than workers. Um, But the intuitive aspect of it is that after people learn the concept, they will never, ever, ever again hear people say, well, I don't have the time and energy without thinking, oh, you don't have the time energy. Because it's not just about having some more time or some more energy to sign up for your local community garden to be a useful volunteer, which means that you do it more than just once a year, but you actually kind of are reliable. You would need to have large blocks of reliable time that you can dedicate towards that. But you don't because your boss does. He's got it. It's his now. And so... I do think that not having a thoroughly fleshed out concept for time energy actually is uh, one of the problems for all the proto uh, time energy theorists. Um, This is why when Daniel Tutt uses otium uh, interchangeably with time energy, he says, oh, well, what you call time energy, I call otium. I say no, because yeah, Time energy is the precondition for otium. Otium is the Greek word for leisure time. It's the thing that Nietzsche said, we we as workers shouldn't really get a taste of because if we get a taste of it, we'll want liberation from work. And he is kind of looking around at his fellow elites, his fellow aristocrats, and he's saying, we have to go to war for our Otium for our leisure time, which comes at the expense of slaves, which comes at the expense of workers. And if we don't have that, we can't pursue the higher arts. And that's just the way that it is. And of course, we love Nietzsche and we agree with him. We just want that for us too. And we don't want it at the expense of everybody else. And so when... when from personal experience as the person here who has gotten to have more of his time energy than most people ever get to... I just want to say it is as good as we say it is like the freedom to not have 
a typical wage labor job in your life is is so qualitatively different a kind of life than the work life that I mean having a wage a typical wage labor job like it, it's it's your life in prison and all I can say is like those of us who are into Lacanian psychoanalysis or psychoanalysis in general uh, a lot of times um, part of what psychoanalysis will tell you is, is the thing you really desire really isn't as good once you get it you're kind of disappointed you won't be disappointed if you get your time energy is what I'm saying because it's not really about like like having time energy it's not like oh you live around you walk around you're happy all the time no it's not this is not the promise of happiness it's the promise of struggling with life in a far better way it's a it's a far greater form of dissatisfaction it's not a utopia it's not happiness it, it, with a capital h it's a livable form of dissatisfaction and that I know somebody will, well, that doesn't sell people on it. Yeah, but it, because I don't want to act like having time energy. Oh, you live in a perfect life. No, you're going to have friends betray you. You're going to have mental issues. There's going to, there's all kinds of problems you can have. The point is though, you can deal with them in such a far more easy way because you're not in this never ending grind all the time. The fundamentally orienting structure of your life and my life is a job and if you can take that structure off of your life your whole life gets to open up where you get to you get more disappointments that that make make you a better person you get more struggles um you get more opportunities to, to, to just live right and living is struggle it is strife but the point of the matter is you're not stuck in this stultifying hell trap of exhaustion, economic stress, existential hopelessness. Um, you get a, 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 a tad bit of hope when the future is open to you, where you feel like it, it boils down to this. I'm somebody with a passion. My passion is for philosophy. That doesn't mean I walk around in bliss every day, even when I had time energy. What it means is that I have something that when I wake up in the morning, I want to get out of bed and go do that gives me a sense of life affirmation. Like I'm glad with what I did in the day. That's not happiness with a capital H. It's not euphoria. It's just a mild sense of contentment and appreciation for what I got to do with my day. And if everybody got that, just a mild sense of, yeah, I'm happy with what I accomplished today. I'm proud of it. I mean, that would be, uh, that's a revolution. And the instant thing, half of you are all thinking there in the audience is like, well, I have felt that at work. And the thing is, is yeah, but then you also spend a lot more time not feeling it at work. And the point is, is that you could just feel it at work all the time. If work was turned into nothing more than the chores you do in the week, you go, ah, I did a great job doing that. I feel great. But then you have... 80 other things that you go do that you also feel great about. Or you have the obsessive thing that you go do, which you feel great, even better about. Because in the world I'm talking about, Dr. Adrian Johnston and uh, Ian Thompson and all these great thinkers at University of New Mexico, they just come to mind at the moment, um, they would still go punch some hours to get the necessary labor done. And outside of that, they would choose how often they teach, when they teach, what they teach, and they wouldn't have to do nearly as much of the administrative bullshit that they currently have to do. Because honestly, if the university wasn't about job training, it would be a lot more like a library you go to where you get to know some people who are really into some of the books. That'd be, that'd be what a real university, because that is what the idea of the university actually is, um, in short. But... On the note about, before we read the quote here, uh, on the note about OTM not being time energy, but time energy being the precondition for OTM, it's also the precondition for Skole. Skole is also leisure time. It's also a, it's also a Greek word. Um, the Greeks were not the inventors of philosophy and science the way we tend to think about it because they're white dudes 
It's because they had a very sophisticated political economy that freed up Skole. And they had a word for it. And so the, the liberal arts are practices that one takes on to make themselves more sophisticated, to be able to live in a world where they have that freed up time and energy. And yes, it was based off of the work of slaves, um, as was almost all of the work that's ever existed in the history of humanity, right? Um, We're wage slaves. Yeah. And black pharaohs had slaves build the pyramids, right? The history of humanity is a history of slavery. The Marxist reading of that is we can read it as a struggle for freedom from necessity. But necessity will never go away. The only thing we can do is find a way to navigate it where we maximize freeing up our time and our energy. And so OTM and Skole are just a couple of words for leisure time. But without understanding what time energy actually is, leisure time is almost always going to turn into what? What would you, how would you guys describe it? Oh, it's, it's, it's bullshit time, bullshit activity. But right. If, it's if, fragmented time. Don't you call it garbage a, time sometimes? I call it, well, because that's energy or time without energy is garbage time. Thanks to Swole. Um, he gave me that. Um, but also uh, energy. So that's that's time without energy. But uh, but uh, energy without time. This was actually when I first talked to Todd McGowan about time energy. He said, he, we actually lost a phone connection right when I told him about the time without energy is garbage time. And then we lost the connection. It was like 20 minutes before we resumed the call. And he's like, yeah, I've just been driving this whole time thinking, what about the other way? Is there uh, energy without time? And I was like, obviously, anytime that there's energy, there's time in a sort of sense, right? Like we'll always find ourselves in time when we have some burst of energy. But the issue is, is that time a large repeatable block of time? No. Our experience is no. Not not repeatable within the week. And and that, you know the, the 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 perfect example I always go to is like let's just say it's the weekend. You're not exhausted for once as a worker on your weekend you're finding yourself energized with your free time. Woohoo. What are you going to do with it? What let's just say you get inspired to learn the violin. That's worthless now. It's worthless. And in fact, it's probably going to kill you. Having some idea of something that you should be able to do that you actually feel a calling towards or at least at minimum an interest in is soul crushing if you can't pursue it. Like that's Mikey's core experience is coming from having had his time energy to then not having it. It's soul crushing. And so... Um, you can't learn the violin on a weekend and you can say, well, yeah, but if you put everything you have towards it when you get off of work and on the weekend, then you would. Um, yeah, it's really easy for college students and uh, people who've never actually made anything of themselves who are now dads to say such things. But the fact is, is um, you should be able to learn the violin and two other languages and explore the world and still be a working person who contributes to society. The fact that that's not plausible is because when you do find yourself with energy in time, that time is not repeatable, reliable, large blocks of energy infused time throughout the week. It's the next foreseeable time that you would be able to practice that violin is probably a month or two out if you're being realistic because next weekend you have a wedding you're going to or you're going to be exhausted or whatever. And so that's well, without- Let me ask you a question. Okay, just a, uh, talking about this this dad you're mentioning. If I told him, hey, there's a book I want to read and study and master and then be able to teach, um, he would probably say, oh, well, then you got to take the weekends and you got to devote three months to it. Can you do that with this book? Three months to be able to. No, no, you couldn't even do that. Get out of here. Why? You're in a. But no, the, the point is, one book like that takes 10 years 
of philosophical you got to learn Derrida to really be able to do it. You got to you got to know Kant. You have to they be familiarize with Hegel. You have to know something about um, Heidegger. Like the amount of prerequisites that go into being able to teach that book. No, somebody can't just go do that. No, they can't. Which there's is probably the- probably there's probably some some you know some PMC guys who just pity us because they know that you were teaching before they don't know what they do and they know that you're some blue collar schmuck they don't know that you actually had 20 years of time energy before being pushed into the workforce they don't know that you're d-class a right sorry nance what were you gonna say yeah was, that raises um the idea of of total cost um and from our perspective trying to acquire knowledge skills abilities qualities whatever um, the total cost is that that time energy that people take for granted. And when you don't have an awareness of the total cost, um, but you still try to go do things, a lot of the times it becomes instrumentalized by um, by capital. Like, oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna pick up violin playing and and I'm gonna be a violin player, but I only I can only do it every once every three months, but you start engaging in the platforms and and in the communities and you might buy a course and you might this and that. And so even that um, sparse relative time energy gets, uh, gets captured, gets re-territorialized. And that I like that. And again, Gores deals with the idea of total cost in other ways when he's talking about um, privatizing like, like public goods and and how the state and support systems don't pay for things. Um, but private consumers wind up paying for shit like infrastructure and roads and healthcare and education and, uh, civic goods and shit like that. Um, but yeah, I just, I, I like that. The, the idea of total cost from a perspective of capital and then from the perspective of a disenfranchised worker. I have a question for both of you based off of that, Nance, because I have something I want to say, but it won't make sense without first establishing what instrumentalization is. Both of you probably see the word come up all the time. You've probably found your own ways of thinking about or with it. And so um, I'm going to step aside for a second while I do something. Just go ahead and what is instrumentalization and perhaps use an example of how uh, it like Mikey, what would it look like if you were instrumentalizing your philosophy study as opposed to what you were definitely doing for the time before you ever worked, right? Like maybe use that as an example and then yeah, what is instrumentalization? What was what does that have to do with profit? So part of it is the way I understand it, the way I use the term has to do with turning something that isn't done or produced for economic gain into something that is used for economic gain. It's close to commodification, but maybe I would say it's a, even a little broader than commodification. It's um, it's a way of looking at things. It's close to what Heidegger calls in framing or Gestell. It's where you look at everything in terms of how can I use everything around me as resources to maximize efficiency. And almost look at instrumentalization as the process of making everything as economically efficient as possible. And so if I was to instrumentalize philosophy, it would be more about, I have X, Y, and Z, I need to teach in this hour, and I'm going to get X amount of money for this hour and everything. And what it does is it doesn't allow the creative process to breathe. Right. I don't know how else to describe it, but there's a certain rhythm, there's a certain breathing process to creativity. And once in a while, like, yeah, it can be helpful to put um, uh, a deadline on something. But for me, right, it doesn't. Like, anything I write is, look, Dave and I always joke, like, oh, well, I'm going to have it done in a week. And then I'm, it's not a week. But the point is, when it is finally done, it's something I'm proud of. So, so well, that would be the, the example right now is your Marxism psychoanalysis and schizoanalysis post that you've been working on since intermittently. When? Yeah. Wait, since when though? 
Well, okay, I started it almost a year ago and worked on it. I wrote a bunch of it in two weeks, about um, almost a year ago. I didn't work on it at all during the, the period I was teaching for They Know Not What They Do. And then I had other stuff I needed to do after the course was over. So I've only really, really been working on it again for about a month. So actually like six weeks total. Okay. Even though okay. it's been like a, a year long I'm just, thing. I'm sorry, but people, he's told me it's going to be done next week or in two weeks, probably like 50 times. And then before yeah. that, before that, so you were working post. on the Master Signifier post and you were working on the Big Other post and the Super Ego post and none of those posts currently exist on the internet. You haven't put any the of them out there. The exists. The OJR post exists. Yeah, there's all these masterful, like, epic posts. And the thing is, is the, they're full of errors. But the errors are like grammatical spelling things because you don't proof shit and you don't have an editor. The point is, is that you've done the work and you've said your piece and you know that you said what you needed to to get the idea across. And that, to me, is the essence of underground shit. And it's part of why I feel like we're really bogging ourselves down with the editorial process here in the underground theory book because – we're doing all this proofreading, which just takes forever. And it's like, okay, I got, I know what it's about. That, sh that should be enough. And so after this one, we're probably going to just write a publisher's forward that from now on says exactly what I just said in reference to what you do. And like, it's warts and all folks enjoy the underground. Like that's what it is. We don't fucking hire editors and proofreaders and we don't navigate with publishers and PR and HR and all of the administrative well, if the writers bullshit. want to proofread it, then they can, they can do that, but yeah, with themselves or with their friends yeah, that's what I mean. or pay me to do it. Cause right now I'm doing it for free, you know? So, and so is Anne and so is Marilyn. And so, but the point is, is so much of, of, of creativity does not work according to capitalist temporality, which is instrumentalized time. Right. And that's what we're opposed to. If, right. if somebody like, Oh, this, this movie, the movie studio, we're going to need that out by, july to compete with blah 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 yeah well what if the fucking movie needs another year now i want to read the quote but i want to first say nance did you have something you want to say about instrumentalization just that um things tend when when we are instrumentalized and um when we are kind of fully absorbed in that things are all flattened out to equally unpleasant or distasteful things um, okay. And, and that sucks. Like that's a shitty state to be in. It is cool when you are freed up to genuinely engage with something that makes you happy or makes you sad. Um, but so, like something that sticks out, like things are all just equally bullshit. Even things that are supposed to be cool all suck just as much as going to work and dealing with all the bullshit. All right, so the comedic timing is off. I would have had to interrupt you, but were you sitting there thinking, did Dave just go to back country? Fucking <laughs> fly. <laughs> is that a bat season? Bring it the fucking bats. <laughs> Fear and loathing in Las Vegas moment. Yeah. Um, fucking bat. <laughs> yeah, these flies are real though. Um, way too real. I actually got that one. It's crawling around on the floor. I got to go finish it in a second. Um. <laughs> But look, instrumentalization, I do think of in-framing every time. Um, obviously, for people who are not so deep into philosophy, or at least our philosophers, you definitely experience a, pr a pretty, or get a, get a good gist of it in One Dimensional Man by Herbert Marcuse. Uh, that's a good starting sorry, point Heidegger for thinking about go, it. Uh, in-framing is not instrumental rationale. They're pretty fucking close. I would say... One thing he, more at the level of strategic thought, Whereas the other one's just like a default way things appear to us, right. but they're they're tapped into the same thing, right? Yeah, just just to for the for the sake of a little nuance sauce, let's pour it all over this thing. Um, in framing is something that poets doing poetry at the coffee shop are still just as much a part of um, as the uh, the scientific managers of capital who are uh, instrumentalizing and rationalizing the workplace, right? Um, 
like the, to, to Heidegger, there is a hope in poiesis, but poiesis is something that goes above and beyond um, everything that's currently captured. And what were you going to say there, Nate? I just no, I, I was going to, yeah, I was going to, I have a bone to pick with inframing, but yeah, I don't need to pick it right now. Cool. And so everybody who's wondering what it is, it is the default uh, mode of world disclosure that we are in. And so for that poet who's writing about how beautiful the trees are and how the trees aren't just for cutting down and exploiting uh, or expropriating, uh, that poet is still writing that with a pen or on a laptop that is still a part of that system of world disclosure. So that system of world disclosure still sees all of the trees in the world as potential um, cellulose. And you're still using the media and the technology that presuppose it all. And so, but I, I do want to hear your bone to pick with that later. Right now, I want to hear you read this quote. But first, let's just say what a corvée is. So a corvée is the rent or, or the tribute that a serf had to pay to the feudal lord. And, it, and that's the word that will quilt this whole quote from Nietzsche. Frederick Nietzsche wrote this. You can read it in volume eight of his life's work. Okay, so let's take it away. If the need, if the need for and the refinement of a superior culture penetrates the working class, it can no longer do that work without suffering disproportionately. A worker thus developed aspires to odium and does not ask for lightening of labor, but for liberation from it, i.e. to impose its burden on another. One could perhaps think of satisfying his desires and massively introducing barbaric Asian and African populations so that the civilized world continues to use the services of the uncivilized world. And thus, non-culture would be considered precisely to be a sort of corvée. And of course, people go, oh my God, he's literally calling for, if we are to liberate the national working class, then we should do it at the expense of of the colonial uh, subjects. Um, I just want to say that, I mean, for his time, he wasn't wrong. If the working class in a nation wanted to actually free itself from necessary labor, it required putting that burden onto another. And there's not enough capitalists to do that labor, so it's not going to be put onto them. So who does it get put on? And what actually happened historically? This was written before Lenin ever wrote imperialism, the highest form of capitalism, or before Nicumbra wrote neo-colonialism. But guess what? It's exactly what he fucking said. Nietzsche is a prophet. Not only is Nietzsche a prophet, but he's saying the cold hard truth of what every PMC motherfucker takes for granted. Unless that person is like, actually, hey, slavery um, and neocolonialism and imperialism, it's actually bad. Now, it's also easy, though, to say it's actually bad in the same way that that poet we just referenced who's sitting there writing and says, this tree is more than just cellulose. It's also this beautiful unfolding towards the light that regenerates our oxygen and blah, 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 and poeticizing it or whatever. Um, that person is still presupposing the system of... Uh, world disclosure that treats everything and everyone as resources to be uh, exploited and expropriated so that we can um, have the things that we like. So we can have Hannah Montana bobbleheads and air conditioning and internet, right? Well, fucking, yeah, that's one of my favorite examples. Dr. Bruce uh, Spearman. No, no. Bru that's no, Dr. The, only way you, and the only way we get out of this deadlock is with automation, with technology. Otherwise, if you don't want to work, then somebody else is going to have to do it. And that's class conflict. That's class struggle. And the only way we can abolish class struggle, I don't want anybody to do, do the work. I don't want somebody to work so I don't have to. I want all of us to get the never ending weekend, right? right? But it's a material, technological, cultural, social, political, economic process that would have to actually start to be mapped out and we start rolling it back and planning it. The point is to facilitate this coming into being at all. And no, like no, nobody has the answer of how to start this tomorrow. 
we have to talk about it first. And that's what we're doing. I mean, that's the role of a theorist in some way. And so, I mean, look, I mean, that's why I can't ever be, uh, you know, uh, like a primitive communist of that or Ted Kaczynski wanting all technology. Like if we want liberation from work, the only way I see it happening is through the autom uh, automation of the global economy. I think the way to yeah, quilt. It's th there's, there's no way out, but through entertaining the primitivist fantasies is, is just as absurd as um, leaning into this. Oh, let's just make the uncivilized savages do it. Like, in, in fact, it might be more absurd because at least the savages quote unquote have been made to do it before there's, there, there's no, a feasible situation where we uh, return to a primitivist state that actually satisfies our needs as as humans, as as the people conditioned to the lives that we live already. It just won't work, right? Yeah. And then to kind of like take all the threads and tie them back up into this beautiful bow here as we close out in these last 10 minutes, I just want to say that the reason the time energy is not OTM is because um, OTM is definitionally never instrumentalized and it's something positive, meaning that it's something that's positively instantiated within a society where everyone else has conditioned your little bubble of privilege wherein you have leisure time, which means no deference to the clock, no stress. You don't have to worry about all the other things going on in that reality, okay? Time energy is not necessarily that because not, time energy is a virtual thing. And so what, what I mean is like it's a potential that gets actualized as labor power because we are schooled to experience freed up time in this fragmented way. Psychologically, we experience time in this fragmented way where it's always now, 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 tomorrow, tomorrow, now, tomorrow, tomorrow, now, yesterday, tomorrow, now. But we're not thinking within 100 year, 1000 year blocks of time. We're not feeling like we're a part of 100 year, 1000 year blocks of time. And we're definitely not thinking about the future in a way that's very serious serious or rigorous or plausible that goes beyond a few weeks from now because we really are focused on immediacy and that sort of immediate time that now time is a decontextualized time it's not real time it's it's capitalist time it's imposed on us we're schooled into it we're disciplined into it if you want to go with Foucault's discipline and punish he's got a chapter on that um, and we'll be talking about that chapter in the time energy seminar which is kicking off is it at the end of October? Sometime I, I, in October, the Time Energy course really gets going. Um, Nance is the first person who signed up for it. So fucking badass. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about that in a second here. But I just want to say that um, Time Energy can be instrumentalized towards things that have nothing to do with profit. Cooperative free association work that requires commitments and showing up by deadlines and actually getting things done with other people because you're passionate about something with those other people, that's going to be instrumentalized. And so that's not leisure time in this sort of sense that's say free of, uh, of, of deference to the clock, right? Leisure time in this sort of full sense of otium or skule. Is, is something, I mean, Bordeaux, at least according to Bordeaux, it's a, it's not a stress-filled time. It is, Mikey, you use the word content, right? And that's because you see this as a kind of time that is sort of in accordance with the pleasure principle. Isn't that right? Yeah. And I mean, it, more of it is, you see, and again, I, I'm, I'm, I imagine there's going to be people watching who aren't Lacanians. Um, all I mean by that is I'm not saying it's even absolute peace, right? I'm saying it's a it's a, a dynamic within ourselves where there's a certain amount of bearable tension where you're not overloaded. I'm not saying it's absolutely tranquil and perfectly peaceful. It's just a level of stimulation in you. It, it'll go up and down throughout the day, right? But it's bearable. It's doable. Right. Opposed to working a shitty job that makes you want to fucking die every minute. And it's hurting and you. By content, I mean not wanting to die every second. And not 
doing the same thing so many times that even if you like doing it, eventually you get worn out on it and then your body actually starts to get hurt, right? Like I had fun um, doing what I was doing at Amazon, but I had to do it so much that I hurt my elbow for the rest of my life. All right, now that... It's crazy, but it was like an experiment. I was like, okay, this is largely automated. I'm working here imagining that I actually live in the automated society and that I only have to do this for a few hours every day. How does that go? And I loved it. The issue is I go for an eight hours longer than I would want to or I do it several days in the week more than I would actually prefer because I do two 12-hour shifts in a week happily if I get the rest of the... I was only doing three 12-hour shifts, but this, the third 12-hour shift killed me, killed me. And the thing is, is I wanted to be the best in the country. I was motivated by their video game system they have there. I, I wanted to see if I could get into the high end of the charts. I'm the, the, the Protestant work ethic is alive and well in me and it's not in Mikey. And so we'd have conversations about this kind of thing. But I actually like, yeah, I'll play the game. I'm going to see if I can win. And I did. I was the number one in the country at Amazon a few times. And I got all these prizes and awards and stupid little pins that represent us that look like minions. It's so stupid. But I did it just to see if I could. And I did. But but winning actually required hurting myself because you're actually doing this movement the whole time. And guess what? If I'm doing that movement all the time, my elbow is not going to be able to survive. And so... You know, of course, they fucking blame me. Oh, well, you weren't putting things in the in the holes right if your elbow's hurting. You should have been. So, of course, they would say you got to go like this and then you got to turn more fully. And then you got to like they actually on their side. No, didn't you watch the training video? Yeah. But the whole point of the video game that I was playing, the virtual reality thing that they set up is so that uh, I push myself beyond the recommended limits. That's why they put that there. Um, and so there's this whole thing. It's a book that I can't publish because of the non-disclosure agreement that I didn't realize was so draconian that I can't actually tell you about that video game and how it works. I'm not allowed to. They'll they'll put me in jail, apparently, or sue me. But um, with all that said, uh, let's, let's do closing statements about Andre Gores. Let's bring this back around to the man of the hour. And, uh, and then we'll close it out. Why don't you go, Nance? I, uh, yeah, I, I wish I would have come across this book a lot earlier. I'm, I'm very pleased that I did anyway. Um, I think it's great. It, it's, there's a person who aspires to be like a proper Marxist who lives inside of me. And then there's a person who thinks he's like an anarcho syndicalist who lives inside me. And in this book, they kind of come together and have a, a productive conversation. Um, and I, and, and I appreciate that conversation. There's also more like he, he speaks to more of like a libertarian, uh, streak, but, he does. but for me, the, the proper Marxist and then the little fucking angry anarchist really do kind of come together in this book in a way that, uh, is awesome and it is kept out of the mainstream um media left or whatever it is um and it's a shame no i feel the same way i think he, he's able uh, bring in a third element here i think gores gives us a conceptual space to bring in marxism as a form of collectivism um, bring in a, a robust individualism or libertarianism um, in a sense that the three of us would endorse. And it also opens up a space to talk about MMT. Um, it does. To bring in. Maybe a fourth thing would be uh, it also connects to left accelerationism like Nick Cernicek and Alex Williams. So it gives us a way to bring together a lot of the, the, the aspects of the left Um because I, I mean, for me, I have the left, if we're going to talk about it or some sort of emancipatory movement, if individualism is not part of it, I, I you know, you know, I, it's collectivism and individualism. I, there's, I, I'm refusing this as a, a choice that we have to make. I feel like a successful collectivism facilitates individualism. Yeah. Um, and you can't have a robust individualism in some sort of like 
typical libertarians like oh there's no st- there's no basically some fantasy into like atomization i live on my own like fuck that okay um i think if we want anything like a robust individualism it's through a well-polished collectivism and so um again he, he uh he, i think he opens up a possibility to bring all this into dialogue with each other um i'll just finish by saying it so i, I do want to read one quote from him um he says, can you drop it were- into the chat? So it's on screen here. Right from page one. Oh, nice. Three. Got it. Yep. Okay. So he says, those who propose a fundamentally different society can no longer be condemned in the name of realism. Now, that obviously smacks of Mark Fisher and capitalist realism, right? Like um, saying, oh, you got to be realist if we can't, capitalism's all we got, you can't do anything else. No, you're not going to, you're not going to throw the term realism or be realistic at us anymore. It's, we, we have to do something else. And um, so those who propose a fundamentally different society can no longer be condemned in the name of realism. On the contrary, realism now consists of acknowledging that industrialism has reached a stage where it can go no further, blocked by obstacles of its own making. So the heart of the point he's making is something like this. The world as we know it is breaking down. Neither capitalism nor socialism can save us. Socialism in the sense of actually existing socialism throughout the 20th century. To be a realist, to see our situation for what it is and act in accordance with this knowledge means to be imaginative, creative, experimental, and improvisational. The only way to resuscitate the future is through a major restructuration of society and of our time energy. Everybody read um, Andre cl- Gores. Everyone read Andre Gores. Now it's time for our, our plugs. We're going to make a couple plugs here. Um, uh, we're going to have Mikey say a couple things about the upcoming course that he is teaching. Um, I'm going to say a couple things about the upcoming course that I am teaching. And uh, of course, the two of us will be together for the Nick Land one. Mikey, I want to do the time energy ones so that you can at least tune in for it um, because these are going to be my sort of, uh, I'll do a deep dive into various texts that are related to um, time energy. I'll be doing that with Nance. People at certain tiers of involvement uh, who are paying for certain tiers of involvement are going to have access to those live. But those deep dives are something separate from the actual seminar lectures I'm going to do on a monthly basis. Um, and those those lectures Um, are meant to take from the history of philosophy um, key moments and really build them out or or flesh them out in a way that makes them shows how they're relevant to time energy theory. For instance, when Rene Descartes in his Discourse on Method says that if we use science, we will be able to create an infinity of devices to satisfy our appetites and remove uh, and, and free ourselves from labor. He, in the exact same breath, says that it'll help us better control our workers or something along those lines. I mean, uh, so so what does he mean, freedom from labor, if he's talking about if he's still presupposing workers doing everything? At the end of that, he's still, he's at the end of the discourse on method. He actually starts thinking about, you know, could a machine be made that tricks us into thinking that it's human? And he was writing about that in like the 1600s, but he wasn't thinking about how, yeah, machines could be made that also do most of the work that those workers you called ours um, have to do, right? So there's these moments throughout the history of philosophy where someone like Kant kind of lets slip that actually he thinks even the academic should be a worker and should think of himself as a worker. And this is something that Nietzsche found abhorrent, 
right? I love how you're going to quilt a through line through all of these guys. All of them, man. But then also there's actually the proto-time energy theorists throughout history. Um, Nietzsche is one of them. He just understands it from the individual standpoint and he has no nothing on his radar. The Right to Be Lazy by Paul LaForge is part of it. Adorno's Free Time is part of it. That that part of Discipline and Punishment, Punished by Foucault is part of it. But up on the screen here, uh, folks, you can see it. Uh, let me share it so you guys can see it as well. Um, if you just go to courses at theory under, theory-underground.com, go to courses. It'll take forever to load because this is the underground and that's just the way that it is. Um, you'll actually see... Um, Let's make sure that everybody can see this. Let me put this on top. These are the courses. A lot of these are past courses that you can take now on demand. Um, people who subscribe at a certain tier from the app get access to all past courses. Um, if you subscribe at tiers two, three, or four, as a monthly subscriber on the app, you'll get access to tiers two, three, and four for all the courses, any course that you might be doing at your underground. Or you can just purchase the courses as one-offs. Currently, we have no subscribers through the app because this is a brand new app. It just went up. So there you go, everybody. Theory Underground officially has an app. Uh, it's on the Google Play Store and the Apple Store. Um, and you can just be a monthly subscriber. You get access to all of the events if you're at the highest tier, obviously. But different privileges come with different tiers of subscription involvement. Um, anyway, as you can see, there is intro to Nick Land here, as well as if you scroll down, Time Energy Seminar, in all caps. Um, so Time Energy Seminar, there will be a monthly uh, expected reading or excerpt, and uh, this is going to go on for six months. Of course, there'll be other Time Energy Seminars potentially in the future as well. But for the first six months, it's just going to be one reading per month, one lecture per month. And then if you're at a higher tier of involvement, you're going to have access to the exegetical deep dive sessions that I do with Nance, which are basically each one of those is its own podcast season. And they are fire. Like if you get excited hearing us talk about anything, you have to know you're going to want to go do some push-ups every time you get out of one of our long form Dialogues because what we do is we try to keep it to only 30% reading or 30% talking about the text, 70% reading the text. We both have good reading voices and cadences, and so it's practically as good as an audiobook. But then when we actually get into it and contextualize it, show how it's relevant, use examples for confusing passages, we tie it into the other stuff that we tend to talk about. It's good. I don't know. Nance, do you want to say anything about that? Because uh, uh, what I want you both to do is make a plug. So we're going to end this on Mikey making a plug for the, what he does and how you can follow him and how you can support him. Um, and also he'll be making a plug for the course that he's teaching, which is the Nick Land course. Um, and he'll talk about how that relates to time energy briefly. But Nance, uh, if you want to get involved with Nance, the only way you can really do that is where? At Theory Underground, theory-underground.com, sign up for all the courses, or at least some of the courses, or at least one of the courses, um, and then reach out and be like, hey, I'm broke, um, but let me let me get the link to some of those streams where we literally spend 12 hours reading um, and, and working through and grappling with texts that... I sure wish would have been available to me when I was a lot younger. I probably could have avoided a lot of um, just bullshit like throughout the course of growing and maturing and learning um, and coming into myself, uh, which is still an ongoing process. But no, it, it, it is the shit. And I fucking that shit does not exist elsewhere. Um, the, the type of, of shit that it is and and I don't have good words for it yet, um, at least in a short form. But it's it's the shit. We read books and 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 we talk about it, um, and it's it's dope as shit. Fucking check it out. And the best way to stay in the loop for all of the stuff that we do is through the Theory Underground app because uh, make sure to turn on notifications for it because that's where you get special um, access to a lot of the things that we do with these hub events um, we're, that we're not even sending out emails on. Right. If you really want to be in the loop, you use the app because we didn't put thousands of dollars and six months of effort into it for nothing. All right, Mikey. 
So, okay, um, I'm the author of the Dangerous Maybe blog over on Medium. Um, written many blog posts, uh, many of which are trying to lay down the basics of essential concepts. So, um, you know, stuff on Lacan, stuff on Zizek, the losing Guattari, Guy Debord, um, Baudrillard. And so if you want to check out anything like that, go to the blog. As far as um, my next course at Theory Underground, it is going to be this introduction to Nick Land. And to say that he's a controversial figure is an understatement, but we are of the opinion that he is fundamentally worth the time and energy it takes to wrestle with his work precisely because of the influence it's had on both the left and the right. And I think right now his, his impact on the right overshadows what he's done to inspire certain leftist thinkers. I mentioned Nick Cernicek and Alex Williams earlier, but um, their book inventing the future is a left accelerationism. Well, this guy is often termed the father of accelerationism, which is a term a lot of people throw around and yet very few people really understand. So um, part of the course, at least uh, one session of it, we're going to, we're going to dive into the different accelerationisms and talk about how I don't think any of them are lands accelerationism. And that's fine. I, I, I I'm not a landian accelerationist. I, if, if I'm anything, I'm a left accelerationist of some kind. Um, but well, I mean, um, it's undeniable that he's a creative philosopher. Um, when, when going into studying any philosopher, I don't care if it's Heidegger or Levinas or Baudrillard, like you enter a new world. And um, <laughs> you certainly enter a new world when you uh, venture into land territory. But that's part of the issue is that he, he like Zizek, has really become an internet meme. When you think about the philosophers who are memes at this point, Zizek is one of the main ones. Baudrillard has a lot of, you know, he, he's very memeable. Um, Deleuze and Guattari on some level, but Land is maybe the most memeable. And I think that has lended itself to his growing cult reputation, right? And part of this course is going to be an attempt to kind of demystify him because I think he at bottom is a materialist philosopher. Um, he does, he, he uses the occult to develop his philosophy, which is something that none of the other philosophers I've ever studied have done. Um, so that's unique there. Um, he's interested in numerology. He's interested in Kabbalah with a Q, um, the occult Kabbalah. Um, he's interested in demonology in a sense, but the question is, if he's a materialist philosopher, how does this all factor in? Because I don't read him as actually holding to anything supernatural or anything like that or spiritual. Um, I think all of these occult dimensions of his work actually play into his materialism. And so, you know, he, he's, he's famous for tackling a lot of different different subjects, but it probably is most famous is how he understands capitalism. Um, it's very influenced by Deleuze and Guattari. He takes the work they did, especially in anti-Oedipus, some of a thousand plateaus, but he disagrees with some of the stuff they do there. He's kind of a wholehearted reader of, uh, and, and a wholeheartedly faithful to anti-Oedipus in most ways. Um, and he takes that and develops a concept of capitalism he mixes it with what he had read at the time on the development and research into artificial intelligence, um, especially with the, the concept of the singularity, like coming from Ray Kurzweil and other thinkers. He's really big into cybernetics, a la Norbert Wiener, but he's also going to take Wiener's cybernetics and flip it on its head and many other um, influences Bataille, etc. Can I kind of just interject and say, like, look, he, he's Mikey's being measured right now, but I just want to kind of be hyperbolic and say that Nick Land is the guy who got everybody thinking seriously 
about the AI techno capital future singularity that is working through our currently existing and past reality to make it so that there will be no human species remaining. All there will be is this circuit of capital reproducing in itself ad infinitum for all time through the universe and that he thinks that that's good and he takes the side of it ultimately. Um, and that... Yeah. And that we well, that's what you see you, in the photo here in the background is this is why he's big into Lovecraft um, fiction is because he thinks that the techno capital singularity is going to be some some kind of Lovecraftian deity. It's going to be something beyond our comprehension and inevitably bring about our extinction. Um, when Dave says it's going to be like capital accumulating for it. It's not like the, the the singularity is going to be a capitalist where it's after profits, but what it's going to do is constantly revolutionize its own code, rewrite itself, accumulate more intelligence. And so it's a capitalist in that sense. It's not like it's, hey, I'm a techno capital singularity. Buy my snack cakes. It's not going to try to sell snack cakes, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, and this is so a common mis this is a common misperception for you because you're teaching this, and so people think that. Yeah, they do think that, well, Nick Lane can't really be, he, he's not really thinking about capital because capital has to be this thing that is only ever created off of labor power. Well, and if we're talking about this entity, as he calls it, emerges out of the process of capitalism, that it couldn't and wouldn't emerge without capital uh, accumulation, which is to say that what we know, commodification, free markets, et cetera, everything that we call capitalism, right? But this, this technological, singularity is going to emerge through this process of capital accumulation but no it's not going to have the mind of a capitalist it's not going to try to sell a shit um it has it'll have other intentions of its own um right yeah people who say that people who say that can't think of capital without consumers and they think that oh for profit to exist there has to be consumers the point is is it's that it does capitalism essentially is what it's going to do. It's the fulfillment of capitalism because retroactively we will have seen, well, it's funny, like we won't be there at that point, I guess, but from some imaginative perspective, we could say this is what capitalism was always headed towards. And the realization of this singularity, there, there won't be consumers to buy products. There won't be markets. It's ending all of that. That's not going to be what it, but it's all of that capitalist process throughout the last 400 years or whatever that led to it. So that it's the fulfillment of capital and we can call it capital in that sense, because think about like how there's all of these material processes that form a baby in the womb, all kinds of proteins and all the, there's a whole, I mean, to try to understand everything that goes into what, what happens once, you know, sperm fertilizes an egg, right? Trying to tell this story of that nine months, but at the end of this process, we retroactively can see like the telos. It's almost Aristotelian final causality. He 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 talks about teleoplexy. There's a certain way he's a teleological thinker, and at the end of that nine months, we go well. That process was building towards the production of a baby, right? right. Well, for him, this whole process of capitalism is building towards that deity we see in the middle of the screen. Um, and so, but along the way, he has, he does all kinds of stuff about what desire is, how it's machinic. He gets this from Deleuze and Guattari. So um, he's, he, he's almost um, a breath of fresh air in a very specific sense, because so many philosophers we know are so focused on language. He doesn't really care about language. He cares about, material processes bodies matter right and so that's also a kind of influence that he had on speculative realism where they were trying to think about what things are like outside of our language outside of our concepts and that outside with a capital o they get that straight from him and so in some way because of ian hamilton grant who was big into the speculative realism movement um, Ray Brassier, all of them were connected with land back in his CCRU days or, you know, inspired by him back in England. 
And so whether we're talking about accelerationism, whether we're talking about speculative realism, or whether we're talking about neo-reaction, we have to talk about this guy. And I think we do ourselves a disservice by not reckoning with one of the most influential living philosophers there is. With that being said, the other things you see on the screen there, the, the little creatures, those are demon lemurs. And if you want to learn about what's going on with them, you'll have to take the course. And if you want to know how Nance and Mikey, two of my closest fellow travelers and friends involved in all of this, um, ultimately agree with land, they just take the side of humanity against the AI god in the future, um, then you'll want to be a part of that course. And if you want to know... Um, how I have a fundamental disagreement with both Nance and Mikey on their interpretation of all of this. Sign up. That's the only way you'll get it. These will be four hardcore sessions, four to five hours, no apologies, but you will get a synthetic Mikey who is draw who's saying, hey, here's like 30 concepts or 15 concepts or whatever that you've heard passed around as jargon. I'm going to, for these four to five hours, unpack all of them in a way that actually historicizes, contextualizes, makes sense of it. And he's going to do it according to the Mikey standard that we've all grown to love. If you know what I'm talking about, you know what I'm talking about. If you don't, then you need to actually read the Dangerous Maybe blog and or my three principles of study as a way of life piece that is currently on Theory Underground under the publications tab. With all of that said, everybody, it's been really good getting this out. The first time we recorded it, it got botched and we lost the whole fucking thing. So we had to wait a month and a half to actually get around to doing it all over again to where it actually felt new. And it did. And I think that this was something special and that this is going to be sort of like the definitive, currently existing definitive video on the concept of time, energy, odium, scole, anti-work, leisure time, and everything about the future and humanity that we value, cherish, and fight for every day of our existence. So thank you so much for coming. This is what Theory Underground cares about. This is what we stand for. And now you know. All right. Peace. Take care, everybody. And now, a quick message from our sponsors. Just kidding. This will be neither quick nor from any corporate or state sponsorship. Hello, everybody, and welcome to a really special PSA. That is to say, public service announcement at Theory Underground. I am David McCarricker, and I'm with Nance and Anne here. And what we're here to talk about is the tour, the Theory Underground uh, publications coming out here on September 2nd. Um, and what we've been doing with the hub event. And so we're going to start out with Nance reporting out on what's been going on with the Theory Underground hub events. Welcome, Nance. What's happening? So 13 hours ago, I jumped on my, on my computer and logged into Zoom and all that stuff. And we started reading uh, Julie Kristeva, right? Yeah. Yeah. We were reading some Kristeva. Yeah. So this morning we, we read some Kristeva and then we, we did a writer's workshop where we shared finished pieces or works in progress, um, read each other's work, kind of uh, gave some critical feedback. And then we read the uh, old Chicago style guide. Then we did the multilingualism um, Spanish segment. And then we did uh, an office hours segment and kind of like, planning and organizing and housekeeping segment. Um, and then after right now, we're going to go on into the multilingualism French segment. And that's just today. Um, a couple of days ago, we did a similar thing with the hub event where um, we actually launched four or five different groups, I think. Social clubs that we've been talking about launching for a long time always kind of like should we do this one should we do that one the idea of the hub event is we get to do them all right yeah so it's it's really cool we um we did film we did an album album listening group we did the the first time we did the french segment um 
Did we do French and German? Oh, we that did day? the German and the French. Oh. We did German and French. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we're doing two a days with with languages. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Last week or last Tuesday, we kicked off the German and and the French segments. Um. And it's it's really cool to have people come in from the community that have a background and some knowledge in the languages we're learning, so we can have some guidance, a little mentorship. And we're launching all these groups that that functionally are social groups, but they're also, um, I guess, forums for us to get get outside of our um, environment and kind of interrogate our own presuppositions and deeply held beliefs a little bit because we're not sitting there being the expert English speakers or we're not sitting there being the uh, Finn McKinty. We're not experts on the music we listen to. We're just people that um, interact with these things. And, and and it's really cool. And it teaches us to be better learners. It teaches us to be better thinkers and it teaches us to be better, actually productive members of a group, as opposed to just instrumentalized members of a, of a group. We, there is some verticality there. We all do bring something to the table. Um, and it's a give and take relationship and it's, and it's really cool. It's a way to socialize and shoot the shit and reify the in group and develop in jokes and jargon and blah, 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 blah. But it also is um, instructive in, in many ways. And it's really cool. And it is the case that we are doing a lot of the groundwork. We're kind of laying foundations for the really awesome people that may or may not see this. I don't know, they may come to it some other way, but the really awesome people that eventually will meet us and become parts of these groups and they will kind of take on the roles um, that we fail to, to play right now because we're not experts. We're kind of just generalists, but it's, it's, it's really cool. We're, we're prefiguring, um, some really awesome stuff and it's a really cool way to spend the time. Uh, I could be sitting around and, and jerking off and having a pity party for myself, but instead I'm like exponentially increasing my own awareness and my own horizons and, and all this stuff. And, uh, it's really cool. And it's awesome when, when people kind of stumble upon the, the groups and the segments and the clubs, like we've had a few people that are, they show up for one thing, they get the email for office hours or they get the email for German or Spanish or the writer's workshop. And then they stick around for another, another segment. And they, they're like, Oh, this is actually awesome. I'm going to stick around and I'm going to become a member of this group as well. So it's really, really cool. Um, I love it. It's awesome. It's great. Part of it's that the 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 app officially has the uh, come out on Android and Apple's stores, and so you're able to get the app. You're able to get into these social clubs. Uh, most of the clubs uh, or most of the forums require you know going through the courses first, but uh, nope, not this not the social clubs. Social clubs are a way of mixing between what we're doing at the courses and. Uh, and things that we just need to be doing as a way of life, like practicing other languages. Um, we have a health and uh, health and fitness segment with the Solitariat. Like that's a lot of fun. And so, someone who comes for the thing on Julius Cruceva, or they come for the Spanish thing, they end up staying for the health and fitness thing. Um, and then we all end up diving into um, a, an actual event. We, we've had. We've already done. Uh, surprise guest speakers. Uh, we've got really special segments that are going to go up on the channel publicly, but then we also have private segments that are recorded that just go up on specific forums. And the hub event is all one Zoom str stream. I mean, it's not, it's not really a stream. It's one Zoom call, but it's just like a huge thing because Nance and I have the time and we know everyone else doesn't have the time, but people are able to jump in. To kind of you know to to jump in to to pop in and out and we want to kind of have a revolving door and and so working people oh i gotta go my boss whatever gotta go up oh, but no get a chance later to put the earbud back in back in and we're kind of preparing ourselves for a bunch of live broadcasting we'll be doing next year as well um and we're trying to make ourselves into the people that we want to be by doing all of these different things that we think that we do better with other people and if you're only interested in writing or if you're only interested in spanish or if you're only interested in film then awesome and you're welcome to just get involved with that and if you decide to branch out into other stuff then great but if not we'll have a lot of fun with you doing what you love and that's why it's really cool that we've got french people german people actually in these clubs we didn't even even plan on that yet I'll, you know we we ultimately want to be able to pay 
um, our uh, uh, Spanish and French tutor to be able to attend those events and actually help everybody. And maybe eventually we'll get a course up. But for the time being, we're kind of prefiguring all of that just the way that Nance said. And so with that though, yeah, thanks Nance. It's been probably the coolest thing this year in terms of my own uh, development as a thinker. I used to listen to a lot of books while playing video games. And I get a lot more out of the exegetical reading sessions that we do to the point where I find video games boring. I think that what we're doing is a lot more exciting. And so, yeah, it's cool. And Anne uh, has some news here about the first of the publications we're announcing, which is Underground Theory. That is right. Um, we all know it's coming out. You can order it on September 1st on theory-underground.com or you can get on Amazon, but it's going to be cheaper on Theory Underground, just saying. Um, but the update is that I am in the process of proofreading this entire 400-something page book. Um, I actually had to skip out on the Spanish meeting today because I just, this is like the only thing taking up brain space for me. Um, Kind of, because also it's like, because it's not a full-time job where I'm getting paid a salary or like $20 an hour to do it, I'm also like, I want to go cook a meal. I need to do my laundry. But all of that is to say, I've really like truly been enjoying the process, not only the process of editing and proofreading, I personally find like meaning, not meaning from it, I guess. I enjoy doing it. I've always enjoyed those like meticulous tasks that a lot of people go, this is bullshit, I hate it, why do I have to do it? I'll do it, I'll be the person to do those things. Um, but it's really fun to like, get to read this book that we've put together with people that we know in real life and people that we don't know in real life and then people like freaking Slavoj Zizek. Like I've had email correspondences with Slavoj Zizek I didn't know who he was five years ago. Like, that's cool. Um, so you can see in here, if I flip through the markups, just basic things. I'm not really fundamentally changing anything. It's kind of just, oh, there's an extra space there. Oh, there's a the missing there. Oh, that period needs to be there. It's, it's meticulous and it's tedious, but this book's gonna be dope. And Dave and I were just talking today about like does this even need to happen can we just call it good as it is and get it sent to amazon and print it as is and you know there's reason dave has reasons for maybe why we want to do that on future books or why that is kind of like a resistance to the the perfectionism of academia but i also see why this is necessary on the one hand it's like well, we've actually got people like Slavoj Zizek and Alenka Dupanchik and Todd McGowan and people that we respect. And I want this work to just like reflect their hard work and I want it to reflect our hard work. And I want for this, especially like, because it has the bigger names, I think there will probably be more eyes on it. And I want those people to see that you can produce quality work in the underground that yeah it's tedious and meticulous and taking longer than we had hoped but like people are going to be impressed they're going to go oh wow this is a legit publication um because then there's also the case to be made well no this is the underground and it's just about the ideas and it doesn't matter and for future books maybe we'll experiment with that but i think because we've just got so many names in this and we never actually set that expectation in the first place and didn't tell people like you need to get this proof read on your own it's like there are pieces in here where i don't even think the author proofread them themselves and it's like that's fine i think some people are just used to like having other eyes on it and i just want everyone's best foot forward in this book i want everyone to look good in this book and not have a reader because you know the, the readers that we want are gonna just not care and just be focused on the ideas that realistically someone is going to read it and go wait this sentence doesn't make sense or oh there's double periods there it's like in a, sh in a sh show on theater like there's always some mistake but people are attracted to the mistakes rather than the like actual performance that's going on or the, or the distraction and so for this first volume that has some big names i just want to make it awesome and so i'm in the process i'm getting close um, I think I can be done soon and have it up in Amazon and ready to print, but it's just been like physically 
taking reading it and writing things down with different colored pens because I don't know, that's fun. And then um, going and sitting and going through and doing the edits on a document. And you might be wondering, well, Anne, why not just do it on the computer in the first place? Because I hate reading on screens. I know this is taking twice as long, or kind of like maybe, I don't know, and a half times as long, but I don't care because the work is more quality when I'm reading it in the text. And just to see the errors and see how it looks is cool. So this book's gonna be as best as it can be, having been, you know, proofread first look through by Marilyn Lawrence who fixed the footnotes and did a fixed a lot of errors and she's been like absolutely incredible and essential in this and then Dave proofread some of them and I've done like the bulk of the the proofreading of just the fixing little errors and so I hope it is reflected in that but also like I didn't go to school for proofreading and editing I have no real credentials other than I learned how to write an essay in uh set sixth grade and then i learned some grammar throughout high school and then i google things constantly i'm like where does the colon go in chicago style that's my qualifications but it'll be it'll be cool so that's what i've been working on I'm excited for people to get their hands on this thing you can hurt someone with this or you can blow your mind with this <laughs> You, you also, part of your expertise is that you did grade people's papers in the university. And so did I. And so I it, that matters. I had professors who actually were like, cared more about the grammar than the content. But yeah, I was also like, I worked in the university. I got accepted into conferences. Like I have some legit, you know, I wrote a, a research paper. So I know what I'm doing. Yeah, and part of the but, issue with this idea of underground theory it's like, okay, by calling it underground theory, we are playing off the idea that you work with what you got and you got to get it out there and you got to do it yourself because you're not in an institution. You're not relying on the institution. You are short circuiting the process. You're breaking through those walls. Um, but also it's not just a qu uh, get rich quick scheme like some of these underground people we see doing stuff where they're just constantly like trying to sell you, sell you, sell you, sell you. We just got to sell you books so that we can get drunk and, uh, and, and, and drive around. And it's like, no, that's not what we're, 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 we're actually trying to make a difference here. We actually believe that this is the beginning of a, of a, of a discourse that's going to, um, be more than just our little local, like, oh, we're just having fun. Like, yeah, we're going to have fun but we're going to have fun because we're also doing stuff that we think matters. And we're the kind of people who can't have fun unless we're also doing something that we think matters. Um, and then the, what, in what ways does it actually matter? In what ways does it actually change the world? And well, these are big questions um, and people can argue about it all, uh, all day, but I, I do believe that a big part of it for the three of us is time energy theory. And the first book on it is the second book that we are publishing on September 2nd. And it really just these are the two books that we're talking about on tour. And so um, we have currently when you're when we're recording this, it is August 24th, 2023. So we've got um, eight days until launch. And then we actually start driving across the country. Right. And so we're going to give you a quick rundown here on the tour itself. On September 2nd, Slavoj Žižek is coming to Boise in the flesh. He's going to literally be there at the Xanadu building in Boise. Just kidding, he's not. But he'll be joining us over Zoom to sort of uh, commemorate the occasion and to give us his, the, the, his clout because ultimately he thinks the idea of some blue collar uh, and working class thinkers um, doing theory and, uh, and and getting out there and getting people into philosophy and stuff in the States, which is like the most anti-intellectual climate in the world today is, is important. It matters. And so that's really awesome. We appreciate that. And so that's something that people will be able to see. We will post it online, uh, but there will also be a zoom call um, and there is there are tickets for the Zoom call available in the description down below, and then um, if the the one free way to participate is just to actually be there in the flesh, and so we are prioritizing the people who actually show up. I'm going to introduce Mikey. Mikey's going to introduce Slavoj Žižek. Mikey's going to explain why 
he thinks Slavoj Žižek is such an important philosopher, and that will be in a lot of way, in a lot of cases, people's first introduction to Slavoj Žižek. I, I think that Mikey is specially equipped to talk about the relevance of some of his concepts and why they're useful uh, to a blue collar warehouse worker in uh, Raytown, Missouri. After we interview him on some really interesting questions, trust me, um, there's going to be presentations from the three of us, as well as Elton and Brian. After that, we're headed to Colorado. And we're going to see Philip, who's been in courses with us. He's got a piece that's in underground theory. It's a really great piece on the state of education and what he hopes uh, will actually help improve it. Um, and we'll be getting together in Breck in Ridge, uh, September 5th through the 7th. The event will probably be on the 6th um, and we'll probably be doing other cool stuff, but we're not going to publicize all of it in this PSA. Then we're going to go see Mikey September 10th in Raytown, Missouri. You see, that's where I have the barbecue on the map and that's because it's Kansas City, right? And so we're going to do Kansas City with Mikey. But the public thing that you're all invited to is actually at a really cool indie bookstore called Prosperos. And so information on that coming soon, but it'll be on Saturday the 10th. September 13th, we will be in Ontario, an hour outside of Kingston at the McLuhan Institute with Andrew McLuhan, as well as the Solitariat, AKA Eamon Stephen. Um, and then from, and he's also, by the way, our fitness and health coach. Right, so it's really exciting that he's going to be there and that he will be presenting on things as well. But this will be kind of like the, the critical media theory focused event of the tour. And then, um, and this is all still kind of coming together like last minute, I, everything about this is tour zero. Could you explain what that means, Nance? So tour zero is an opportunity to get out and um, it's like on the job training. Um, do the thing, but also fail because failure is, is, is always going to happen, but uh, learn from our failures. And it's not that there's less less pressure, but there's a different kind of pressure, a different kind of public pressure. Um, the, the pressure will be more coming from inside the house rather right. than being concerned with um, spectacularly failing and everybody writing it off is just a bunch of dickheads from the Internet. Right, right, right. Which is which is why it's tour zero rather than tour one because the next one will be better yeah exactly that's exactly it and so you know in pretty in pretty record time i've been able to throw this thing together and i've done that with a lot of things that i've done in the last year um but I've, i'm just interested in making a splash with theory underground in the first year so that people who see what it could be um get involved and so then the in I, we're really excited about this one. We're going to be meeting Todd McGowan himself. We're going to get together at University of Vermont. There's going to be presentations. Um, he's going to present, but he won't be the keynote because he said that would be weird at his own university, which makes sense. Um, but we, we get to hear him present on the continued relevance of German idealism and why it matters. And I'm just really stoked about that. And we're all going to be presenting on our thoughts um, on related issues. And then. New York City, we're going to be seeing Samuel Loncar, Norman Finkelstein, Norman Finkelstein, Norman fucking Finkelstein, and Russ Brigula. And so. Norman X Finkelstein, fascist. Yeah, that's right. Norman X Finkelstein, um, which is how he uh, put his name on the newest book. Uh, I'll burn that bridge when I get to it. Um, and he'll probably be presenting on his problems with. Uh, identity politics, his radical left critique of it, but also he might be presenting on uh, the Democrats and their failure to do diplomacy um, and how he thinks that both sides of the political spectrum are uh, trying to build up for a nationalist uh, world war or an imperialist world war, we could say. Um, so that's another thing that is going to be fascinating. Um, then we're going to probably dip into DC before we go back to the other side of the coast. And we've, we've got several people that we're talking to or with about doing all kinds of things, but we kind of want to keep it vague because some of the things we're doing is for a documentary. That's a super secret project. No one gets to know about it until later. Um, but also uh, we're doing some things like going to see a Broadway play. We're all going to go see Gutenberg in New York City on, what is it, like the 15th, right? 
15th or 16th, yeah, I went to see those nights. Um, it's a new musical. It's only on Broadway for 20 weeks. It's uh, Josh Gad and Andrew Reynolds, who were the original Elder Price and Elder Cunningham in the Book of Mormon. And it's supposed to be super funny. And it's also about the inventors of the printing press. So it's kind of relevant to like critical media theory and Marshall McLuhan. And it'll be interesting to see the content, but also it's apparently hilarious. And I'm a yeah, it's going to be really cool. And then we'll also do probably a couple others as well as a couple of museums. And a lot of that's if people want to get involved with that, it's just going to be word of mouth. And so you just have to kind of get with us because these are not just uh, consumable, consumable things on demand. Uh, we're kind of making the point that just doing stuff with people in real life is more important than just um, being sort of existing in videos or podcast stuff where people just have you on demand. It's like, no, actually sp sharing space and making time for one another. Like that's, it's real shit. And that's the whole point. People were like m making fun of the original description of what's in this volume because it used the word real. I think that's an important word. And I think that there's some people who just don't care about keeping it real. And that's just why we do what we do. So, um, then we're going to go on to Chicago for a platypus special event they're putting on for us where we're all going to present, Catrone will present, um, and who knows how that's going to go. But basically, we're going to spend a lot of time thinking about what we're going to present at this thing. And if, until it actually happens, we're going to keep it pretty hush-hush. But you'll be able to see uh, the Facebook and the website and the meetup um, events um, as they develop. And so there'll be more information on all of these soon, but then we're going, and by the way, for people who are like, well, I thought that this was all happening like th through September and October, we decided to do it all in September because we decided this is two or zero. So then a uh, secret surprise thing in Denver. So stay tuned. That'll be September 24th or 25th. Uh, Catherine Liu is getting with us on uh, September 26th and or through the 27th in LA and there's also a big secret and surprise thing that's going on in LA that Nancy's grinning because he knows <laughs> oh yeah and you you know the thing I told you off camera the th I talked to the producer of the show of the remember? yeah so it's exciting um, and then we're going to go to the Vegas Punk Museum and Nancy's going to give us a tour of the fucking thing, which is just, to me, I've always been fascinated by the subculture. It's had a lot of influence on the left. It's had a lot of influence on hardcore. It's had a lot of influence on underground scenes everywhere. And so it's historically fascinating, but also arguably a dead end. <laughs> and so there's this whole like argument we're having amongst ourselves about its relevance. Um, is being compared to punk or underground stuff in the first place even a compliment or is it actually kind of a self-own? We're open to it being a self-own. We're actually kind of self-aware that a lot of people are taking this stuff more seriously than they should in the wrong ways. And we're taking parts of it more seriously that nobody actually takes seriously or tends to underestimate, right? So we're trying to, to do something here and people will hopefully kind of get the sense for what it is that we're developing with all of that here on this tour. And then we're going to Reno. There's gonna be a film club special. I used the thumbnail from our last film club meeting. That's not actually the one we'll be doing there. That one's gonna be a surprise. Um, and it will only be public if we find a public location. Otherwise, it'll probably just be seven of us back at a private residence. Finally, um, Ashlyn, October 1st, slacklining. We're just literally doing a slacklining focused event and sure we'll have the books there and we'll talk about them, but this will be advertised on Meetup as well as Facebook as a slacklining event. And the point is, is to just kind of get in your body, find balance, you know, breathe. And we'll do a whole thing on balance and why it matters um, there. But it's, you know, all a way of kind of integrating aspects of life. And, and, and bringing a sort of balance to ourselves who are otherwise super siloed into consumer niche demographic, niche demographics for consumerism. Um, then Portland, Burnside Powell's, um, potentially a clubhouse. Somebody is currently trying to reserve for us the cl uh, clubhouse at some place. Um, so stay tuned for that. And then we're going to be probably doing something in Seattle, it looks like, with J.M. Adams of the New Center for Research and Practice, as well as potentially a couple of Jay's friends. And uh, it looks like there's actually a DSA chapter there who wants to bring us. I find that super interesting. Like, 
I'm going to give them my critique of the left, basically. <laughs> I'll present it to them. Um, and at the same time, lend them encouragement because uh, at least one of the things that I know that they're doing, I think is fundamentally important, regardless of what you believe in or who you're affiliated with. Um, they are doing some, some mutual aid kinds of activities there that seem cutting edge uh, according to the conversation I had with somebody. And so that's exciting. And then this is tentative, but I think we're doing something with Bruce Beerman back in Spokane and that'll end the tour. And so that's the whole thing. Um, we're, uh, we're gonna basically have it all done within a month's time. We just got a minivan for doing this. It's gonna be the three of us. And we're just excited to meet some people from the internet, to meet some old friends, and to uh, see what we can do with uh, getting these ideas spread more widely, getting people time energy pilled, helping people realize that they don't have to go through academia to, um, to still get a quality education and to be developing themselves as a thinker in their own right, as a way of life, as a longer term project that only gets better as you get older, instead of tapering off and then you have a miserable last 30 years of your life, you're actually developing yourself to, to, to be able to intervene in your prime intellectually right? And to be at your best between your 60s and 80s. Like that's, I mean, that's actually what philosophy is for, is for becoming uh, someone who has something to say and someone who other people want to hear from. And that's not something that you're going to get at the age of 20, at the age of 30, at the age of 40. It's something that only comes after 20 to 40 years of study and research and in, in real dialectical engagement with the world. And, you know, like we're serious about it. We think it's going to be great. Um, and uh, fun. Anybody have anything that they want to say is close? Ryan Gosling will be with us. Ryan Not the Gosling. actor. <laughs> Not the actor. This kitty that Anne is holding is Ryan Gosling. He will be with us. Um, in some cases, um, he will be camping in the van overnight, and I'll probably sleep with him those nights uh, because in some cases, he won't be able to stay inside where we're at because um, some people are allergic, and that's too bad because he's the most precious kitten in the world. That's like about as bad as allergic to, no, not allergic, but having that gene that makes cilantro taste like soap. Like, That's allergic to cats. It's like, ah, I'm sorry, your intestines just looking out. But you don't, I don't fuck with cats, and I never felt like I was missing out until I met Ryan Gosling. <laughs> He's the cutest puppy in the world. <laughs> Oh, and he likes puppies. So that's, that's quite the compliment. Um, yeah. And didn't used to like cats too much either. So we're all into them now. Um, you know, it, it's, it's a, philosophy. it's a thing that if comes anyone wants to know about our Dave's philosophy of cats. Let us what, know. Once you've grown up, you'll understand. No. <laughs> yeah. I'll write that book eventually, but all right. For now, we're excited to see you all on the road. And right now we're just kind of, uh, frantically doing all of the things and falling behind and still somehow getting it done. And uh, we're putting off some of our courses until later, just to, to give ourselves a little bit of breathing room um, and to really give this tour a fair shake because I think you all deserve it. We deserve it. And it's going to be a great time. So thank you for listening to this normally sized ad in a YouTube video. <laughs> <laughs> Peace.